So you make an interface to say that this object is interactable. Now another interesting thing are over here the player icons. Using depth of field is a very simple way to... Hello and welcome, I'm your CodeMonkey, a professional indie game developer, and here I will react and analyze a gameplay trailer. I will talk about how things work behind the scenes and how you can build them in your own games. You can watch the full playlist if you want to learn more about some other games. In this case, we're going to be looking at the Battlefield 2042 gameplay trailer from E3 2021. Alright, so let's hit play. Okay, so one of the first interesting things that we see is this grappling hook. So the player aims roughly where they want it to connect. The hook fires and connects, allowing the player to swing around. So as for how this works, there's two ways. It all depends if the grappling hook is an actual moving object or not. So if it is, then the player simply fires the projectile and goes straight forward. And then the projectile itself looks for things to attach to, like for example that railing. So that might be what they're doing, but I suspect they're instead just doing a simple box cast. So a box cast is really just a raycast from one direction, so think of it as like a virtual box. So it does that towards where the player is aiming, and they give it a certain size so the player doesn't have to aim perfectly. So here, for example, it will connect onto this railing around here, but the player is aiming up there. So the box cast is a bit bigger just to make it easier for the player to hit their target. So it does that and really just looks at the one that is closest to where the player is aiming at. Then for defining what exactly is an edge, now sometimes that can be done automatically so it dynamically identifies all of the edges, but really most of the time it's really just a manual process. So a level designer goes in and says that all of these things, all of these things are possible valid edges that the hookshot can hook onto. So most of the time all of this is just manually defined and then the code symbol looks for which ones are valid objects. So it just identifies the closest edge, then it fires the hook and really just plays an animation so it's just interpolating the hook position until it connects, and then it connects and the player can pull. So speaking of that, on the grappling hook, the swing is also quite interesting. Now if I had to guess, I would assume the player has some control for how they shorten or elongate that hook rope. So while swinging, the player is shortening the rope and taking advantage of the momentum in order to pull them up. Then for the disconnect, so here it's connected and then here it disconnects. So for this one, either it's manual, or more likely it's really automatic. So it knows the player position, and it knows the hook position, and then simply calculates the vector and checks if that one is behind the player. So it knows the FOV where the player is pointing at, and perhaps it's as simple as if it's behind it, then you simply disconnect it. Then maybe you also take into account the momentum, how fast the player is going, how far along in the swing they are, and so on. So there's many things you can take into account in order to make Disconnect feel really seamless. So you put all of that together and you've got a very interesting gadget. Makes me wonder just how difficult it is to make these sort of cool moves. I assume it's going to be very easy. Then over here we also see a takedown animation. Over here on that one, that is pretty much just a normal animation. So in terms of logic, this is really just a simple distance check. So this player right in here, it does a sphere cast to identify all of the objects around a certain area then identifies an enemy player within that area. And if the enemy is within range and it's in front of the player, then it simply shows a button prompt in order to enable the player to press the button in order to trigger the takedown animation. So in terms of logic, it's really simple. It's all the animation that sells it. Then over here, we also see a massive sandstorm. So a bit of a fun fact as to how these things are usually made. Now, if you're not a game developer, you might assume that this is a really complex particle effect. But in reality, these are likely just simple images. Usually effects like this one are simply made by some basic sprite sheets. So you just create all of the various frames and you interpolate them between frames in order to make it look really good. And really what they are is really just giant quads that are constantly facing towards the camera. So it looks really massive and really complex, but in reality it's really just a bunch of very fancy visual trickery. <laughs> 
Then over here we see the tank drop. So this is going to be an interesting game mechanic. Essentially you can call in vehicles from anywhere. As for how that works, I assume the player has some sort of iPad-like device. So you use that to select specifically which vehicle you want to spawn. And then for the position, it simply looks at the player's cursor. There's a raycast to identify the exact terrain position where the player is looking at. Then perhaps for a visual, they might also show a ghost visual, like the one that I used in my house building system in order to identify where the tank will actually land. And then it's simply a question of just spawning the tank and letting it fall down. Then on this shot, we can see all of the usual battlefield icons. By the way, if you find the video helpful, please hit the like button. It's a tiny thing, but it really does help. Thanks. So we can see the player names, we can see all of the objectives, a bunch of airplanes. So for how you would display something like this, you could build a simple world space canvas. That's one way that lets you use UI elements, but place them directly in the world. So as the player is moving forward, all of the elements stay on top of their position. Now, another interesting thing are over here, the player icons. Since this game is going for a massive scale with 128 players, the screen would look really busy if all of these players had their names above them. So as you can see, all of these dots, all of them, they are unique players. So you can imagine just how crowded all of this would look if all of these had their names on top of them all the time. So what they did is limited the ones who showed names to only the squad mates. So those do show their name as well as their current health. But then they also showed the names of other players as long as the player is looking directly at it. So on this shot right here, as the tank drops down, the player looks. As you can see, this one is not a squad mate, but since it's right in front of the player's reticle, it shows the name. So again, this is really just a simple box cast around the player's mouse position. And if it collides with other players, then you expand in order to show the name, the icon, and so on. And by the way, all of these gorgeous explosions that you see are also using the same technique that I mentioned a while ago for the sandstorm. So over here on the big one, the sparks, there are some actual particle effects, but for the explosion itself, that is really just another sprite sheet effect. If all of this were actual fire simulations, then the game would really slow to a crawl. So when possible, always make sure you get some visual trickery instead of just trying to recreate reality. Then over here, these players run into the elevator. So they're running and one of them pushes the button and actually closes the door. So this is pretty much exactly what we saw previously for the takedown animation. So this player right here, it's doing a sphere cast right around his position. And if it identifies objects that can be interacted with, then it shows the button prompt so that the player can interact with that object. As for how you create an interactable object, this is something that I covered in detail in a previous video. So one of the best ways to do it is really just to implement an interface. So you make an interface to say that this object is interactable and that way the player class doesn't even have to identify a specific button type. It just knows that there's an object within range that can be interacted with and simply triggers the interface interact action. So always a great way to make sure that your code is super modular and works with anything. Then over here on the elevator, we get a nice break in order to see the in-game weapon customization. So you can modify your loadout directly while playing. There's no need to go into a separate menu. As for how this works, again, it's a simple world canvas just layered on top of the camera. Note how this also enables the depth of field effect. So this player is really close, so this one is in focus. The weapon, of course, is also in focus. But the background down there is all very blurry. Using depth of field is a very simple way to always bring your player's focus into one specific object. Then for interacting with the menu, it's going to depend if the player is using either a mouse or a gamepad. So if the player is using a mouse, then the mouse is likely being used exactly as a mouse. So all of these work as simple buttons and the player just clicks in order to switch them. And if the player is using a gamepad, then these are likely just simple buttons activated with D-pad. Note how this is structured in a cross-like fashion in order to perfectly emulate the D-pad that you have directly on your controller. As for the modifications themselves, it's really just applying some visual changes to the weapon mesh, and then of course changing whatever gameplay changes these mods do. Then another thing that I haven't mentioned yet is simply the UI. It's mostly pretty standard, just a bunch of icons. So the more complex stuff is the minimap. Now making the minimap itself is pretty easy. 
I covered it in a specific video quite a while ago. Now the more interesting thing are all of the areas on the map. So you can see the enemy captured areas in red, neutral in white, and friendly in blue. As for how you can handle that, it can be really just playing around the texture and some pixel manipulation. So you have the map texture and a bunch of textures working as masks. Then you simply tint the area covered in that mask with a certain color. I covered something very similar a while ago when I remade the cleaning minigame from Rover Mechanic Simulator. That's exactly the kind of method that you could use to build a map with multiple areas. Here is the wings to drop, looks really nice, and it's pretty much just some very simple logic. So as the player jumps, you simply constantly tell the player's velocity, and you check and if the Y velocity is under a certain minimum. So let's say the player is moving down at minus 5 meters per second. If so, then the first thing is you change the animations. So right here, note how the weapon is still in the normal position, but as he falls down further and further, as the velocity increases, yep, he switches into the different animation. And then while you're in that second state, you can enable the wingsuit or the parachute deployment. Then over here we see the sandstorm tornado, so it's going to be really interesting to see how they implement this. All of the players and vehicles are essentially being pulled towards the tornado. Now doing that in terms of logic is very simple, you really just apply a force to the rigid body. The tricky part is how do you implement that in such a way that it doesn't cause player frustration by being unable to control the character. So in this shot, the current player and this player next to him, it seems like their movement speed is still perfectly normal. So perhaps there's some sort of hard cutoff, so movement is normal until you're right inside the tornado and then you'll lose complete control and probably die after a while. So it's going to be interesting to see how they implement this. Alright, so there you have it. That's my analysis of the Battlefield 2042 gameplay trailer. I can't wait to see what more they're going to show in July. I really like this modern military setting, so I'm super happy that Battlefield is going back to it. The response to this trailer has been pretty great, so let's hope the final game is awesome. Okay, so I hope you found the video interesting and useful and learned something along the way. Check out the full React playlist where I already covered a bunch of other games. Alright, hope that's useful. Check out these videos to learn some more. Thanks to these awesome Patreon supporters for making these videos possible. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.